You're listening to Don't Waste Water. That flywheel is so quick. It's like taking that information in, digesting it quickly, making a change, implementing the change. And I like that kind of metabolism, that agility, and also like agility with customers, flexibility. And I just feel like everyone's on the same page. You know, you don't have kind of this, my agenda is X and your agenda is Y. We all have the same agenda, <laughs> which is grow. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Twist Water podcast. And you're giving up something you know, a job you know, a sector you know, technology you know, people you know, a company Company, you understand how it works to something completely different. Yes, it's a risk. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, and in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Kimberly Kupiecki as my guest. And he's like, you would be shocked at the stuff I ignore. And I'm like, I never forgot that. I'm like, if he can say that, I can figure it out too. So Kimberly is Senior Director at Ginkgo Bioworks. We're going to do success-based payments for some of our services, such as enzyme services. We are almost completely de-risking programs for customers, especially okay. at the front end. We will work out a technical success milestone, if you will. If we can meet that, then customer pays us. If we cannot meet that, customer doesn't pay us. But it really kind of makes it very easy for customers to try new things and to get on board and get on the platform, especially if it's something that they haven't done before. Ginkgo Bioworks is the software company for biology coding DNA to create custom cells that solve real world problems. What is the world's largest company? Can you guess? Let me help you. It generates an estimated $125 trillion annually, so no, it's not Amazon with its tiny 500 billion revenue, Saudi Aramco and its little 600 billion, or Walmart and its teeny 610 billion. Indeed, that giant company is 10 times larger than the 15x largest ones combined. So what does it do? Well, it specializes in ecosystem services. It supports carbon sequestration, biodiversity, clean water, and so much more. And that company is called nature. It's not me putting this $125 trillion mark on natural asset services. It's the Rockefeller Foundation, not exactly a hippie punk or a natural activist, right? But if it proves one thing, it's that nature isn't just a treasure trove of biodiversity. It's a goldmine of business opportunities. But a $125 trillion cake is a bit too large to grasp. So let's zoom in on enzymes, nicknamed the workhorses of the biological world. Like no one says that. That's weird. Enzymes are catalysts that accelerate chemical reactions, making them indispensable in a range of industries. As I speak, enzymes are breaking down complex sugars in biofuels, decomposing pollutants in water treatments, or removing stubborn stains while processing your laundry. They're the unsung heroes making processes faster, more efficient, and often more sustainable. But here's where it gets truly fascinating. At the edge of nature's treasure and human ingenuity, we're entering the age of enzyme services and cell design, often simplified as biotech. In that age, we can imagine seeing custom-crafted enzymes performing specific tasks like tiny biological robots. It's like coding, except that your programming language is DNA and your output is a living organism designed to solve real-world problems. Get ready to take off in a minute, Kimberly will take us to the world of synthetic biotech Biology, exploring Ginkgo Bioworks high throughput screening, surprising business models like success based payments, how biotech is revolutionizing industries, including water treatments, and why agility and risk taking are key to making waves in this space. But right before that, let me remind you that you can help me out tremendously by taking this episode and sharing it with a colleague, a friend, your boss, or your team. If you're new here, welcome, take a seat make sure to subscribe and I'll meet you on the other side. This podcast is brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Hi, Kimberly. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited for many reasons to have you. First, because we spoke last year. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed since last year. I remember. And you're in a field where I have to confess from the beginning on, I'm a total layman, total muggle. So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to discover a bit what you're doing That's there. Great. But I have traditions which start with the postcard. So what can you tell me about the place you're usually at when you're not in Edinburgh to the Boutique Forum, which I would ignore by now? <laughs> I'm usually in Minneapolis, St. Paul, working out of my home office. Yeah, either that or on a plane to Boston. To break a bit this, this ice to this field I don't know, I've seen you pitching twice, so I have a better idea now. Good. 
What is your best elevator pitch to Ginkgo Bioworks? And do I pronounce it Ginkgo right? Ginkgo Bioworks, Ginkgo. like the Ginkgo tree. Ginkgo Bioworks is a synthetic biology technology platform. Our expertise is we can program the ACGT of cells, similar to how you would program the ones and zeros of a computer to program those cells to make molecules or to do certain functions. The difference between the computer coding and genetic coding is you're actually coding for atoms versus knowledge. I've seen how you have different fields where you're coding and most of the fields today are not water, but we are also doing something in water. So how big is the water part? Is it a growing section? How, how do you define it? We would like for it to be a growing section. Certainly we've had some traction in the biosensor space, working with Alonia, working with a company called FredSense. FredSense yeah. This is to develop some very specialized enzymes that will react in a certain way when they're exposed to a particular contaminant, if you will, selenium or whatever else you're looking for, PFAS. But there's just a myriad of applications that we see out in the world that can be applied to all sorts of different applications in the water space that the water industry could really take advantage of. You're looking after all applications or do you focus on the water yourself? Myself, I would be broader than water, but mm -hmm. um, probably more still in that industrial space, energy, materials, um, although I am dabbling in pharma these days. It is a platform. <laughs> You have this foundry. How could you define it for the layman like me? The scale of this place is stunning. The scale and capabilities are incredibly advanced, which is important because it allows for many, 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 I guess, tests to be done to understand when you're looking for the right type of biological response, if you will, you need to test a very broad swath of different types of constructs of that code, if you will. You can start it in silico. You can get pretty good at starting points. And Ginkgo has an incredible, what we call code base to mm -hmm. build from. But once you have that, the interesting thing I've noticed about Ginkgo is because it has this capability to do massively, it's called high throughput screening, which means you could do massive amounts of tests in a short period of time. They can discover things that are outliers that sometimes are exactly the thing you're looking for. And that is to me, part of the secret sauce. I'm trying to connect the dots. So you'll tell me if it's totally stupid. I was discussing with Camera yesterday mm -hmm. and we discussed about bio-based polymers. And yep. the explanation was that they are not cooking the monomers. They are taking the monomers and transforming them into polymers. Mm -hmm. Would you be a potential supplier of the monomers? We could provide the biology that can code for those monomers. Okay, so yeah. it's one step before. Just a half step. Now we can scale up to a certain level, but it's usually to prove out the process and then we would transfer that process to a commercial type provider. Are you creating stuff or are you emulating what exists in nature? A bit of both, I think. You know, usually there's something based in literature that we can start with. So say you want to generate a particular, I don't know, some sort of molecule maybe a small molecule for a material. There's usually somewhere either in literature or something that we've done in the past that's similar to build off of. But does that mean you can make it in commercial quantities? No. Does that mean it's actually effective in what you want it to do? No, it just means it's possible. It's possible. So you sort of start with what's possible and you say, okay, what do we need to do? We need to optimize it. We need to optimize the code, but also the, the process to you know manufacture that material. Can we take an example so that uh, I grasp a bit your process? Let's take, for instance, FredSense. Okay. How does it start? We could take um, that one. What's the first inquiry? Who contacts who? How does that work? Because Ginkgo is still, I think, just like really expanding into different industries. It's a lot of us doing the outreach, mm -hmm. but I don't know specifically if FredSense came to us or we went to them. I, 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 I don't have that history, but it's really starts with those targets. It's like, okay, we really want to create a biosensor for selenium, for an example. Then Ginkgo will say, okay, yes, there is a, a bug that can make an enzyme that will bind to selenium. Great. Let's start there. And then you say, okay, there, th that's where you start from. You look at that code base. Then you say, okay, what do I actually need it to do? I need it to do X, Y, and Z, and I need to be able to you know, manufacture that enzyme at a certain concentration. We call that titer, et cetera. You sort of like take this thing that's not commercialized or it's just very sort of like academic, and then you can like build it up. And then of course there's an iteration of testing, right? Because what Fred said says it needs to do is take that enzyme, put it into their system, run their process on their end to make sure it works. If you take now that enzyme, which is developed for FredSense, who owns the IP? Is it still you or do you share the IP? Can someone else come and say, hey, I want the same than FredSense? That's a good question. And it, it's sort of a case by case basis, but mm -hmm. typically what we 
the way we approach IP is we have all of our background IP that bring, we bring to bear. And the reason that, you know, we can be successful with customers is we have all that background IP. So we have a very rich, you know, place to start and really great starting points. But of course, the customer wants that competitive advantage in the market. We also want our customer to have a competitive advantage in the market because the way our business model works is we get value from like a downstream value situation. That means the IP, it's important to kind of define the field of use. So there's a lot of, you know, usually negotiations around IP. What's the field of use? Where are those boundaries, et cetera. Can you explain that that business model where you get the value from the downstream value? Yeah. And actually we've we've doubled down even more on that. Our CEO, Jason Kelly, recently announced at our customer conference called Ferment um, that we're gonna do success based payments for some of our services, such as enzyme services, which we're very good at. So what that means is we are almost completely de-risking programs for customers, especially okay. at the front end and that discovery end, um, and even, even beyond that at times. So we will work out a technical success milestone, if you will. And if we can meet that, then the customer pays us. If we cannot meet that, the customer doesn't pay us, but they also don't, they wouldn't get the IP as well. You know what I mean? So they would, they might also continue the project possibly, right? But it really kind of makes it very easy for customers to try new things and to get on board and get on the platform, especially if it's something that they haven't done before in terms of even outsourcing R&D, but then of course, outsourcing R&D in synthetic biology. So you take kind of a picture of a status quo, you define what could be becoming better, mm -hmm. and then you take a share of that becoming yeah, so better, that's as, the first you part. achieve it. That's just to cover, that's sort of more the technical milestone and the success-based payments is for that R&D investment the time, the space in the platform, et cetera. Then that is sort of just like a cost coverage model, even with success-based payments. Then really what's most interesting to us is really get these new innovations out in the market. So we look at what's the downstream value, whether that's small percent of earnings or, or revenue, or sometimes it's a per volume. So it depends on what the product's gonna be. And there's different ways to kind of structure those. But the downstream value is really where we see the growth in the company and, and the growth in, in these applications and the bioeconomy itself. You mentioned the applications. I gave you this example of FredSense. I mean, I was interested to understand a bit better what you did with them. It was one of the five or six different application fields which you listed in Watcher. Mm -hmm. So what would be the other ones? And if you have to pick your favorite child, if that's possible, <laughs> What's the one? Well, my favorite is whatever the customer's favorite is. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in bioaugmentation products that, you know, you might add like a cellular colony to do a certain job in a wastewater, for an example, like denitrification or something like that. And, you know, can you make that organism work harder? Can you make it work in a higher pH, lower pH, higher temperature, lower temperature? Kind of taking what biology already exists and making it better. And I feel like that might feel a little less risky, right? For some of those providers, but also I think there's a lot of opportunity, you know, kind of transferring the knowledge from the work we've been doing in the materials space. So taking fossil fuel based polymer, for an example, you gave the Chimera example, can we make that monomer from a biological source? And can we do that economically enough that it makes sense? Can we even do it uh, with a waste feedstock, can you genetically engineer a bug to kind of preferentially use a compost waste feedstock, for an example, versus like a pure sugar and make the same molecule at enough of a concentration that the economics work? So those are the sorts of things. Certainly some of the others, uh, a lot of applications in anaerobic digesters, whether it's mm -hmm. improving biogas production, halting the process and taking the volatile fatty acids and making those into monomers that can go into sustainable aviation fuel, or there's things you can do on the front end with a hydrolysis. And there's so much opportunity, I think, in terms of just improving the processes that already exist. I would see a red thread, you know, the example you just gave, it's really about having a positive impact mm -hmm. was a pretty easy one to put together all the ones you, you, you shared. What's your definition of innovation with impact? I mean, I think it is that commercialization, right? We want to see these innovations get all the way to market and we want to see those changes. So it is exciting to start seeing companies like Asolve who are like getting into biopolymers, right? I mean, that's a big, bold move that they're making and they chose us to be their partner in that. So we really are looking for partnerships, not like really a transaction or a vendor relationship. And the reason for that is because we do want to see that impact and we want to see those innovations get out to the commercial market and make a difference. Do you have to do education on a business level because you're coming with something which is arguably pretty new 
And you're coming with this pretty clever approach of the value-based business model. Mm -hmm. So do you have to convince your customers they have to change multiple parameters at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of education because Gitgo is somewhat of a unique company, which is a little bit difficult because you can't say, oh, we're like this thing. <laughs> and we are in a sense, but I mean, I, you're not the Uber of, um, yeah, exactly, or <laughs> yeah. So that's why like, maybe you can think of other platform companies, but like operating systems is one I go to. But I think because of the way the business model is structured is a little different than like what we would say a CRO or a contract re research organization that would say, okay, give me your specs. I'll run the test. I'll give you back the data. And it's a transaction. I see you later. And the data is the data and you go do with it, whatever. It's much more of an engagement, I would say. So, so it's a little different. So we're different than a CRO. And I think because also we're different from like an Amaris or like a, you know, a company or Novozymes that will make an end product that they will sell to a customer. We don't make the end product either. So that makes us a little hard to compare and describe. So yes, education is definitely important. Different and challenging or different and pretty easy going? Different and challenging for sure. Yeah. But I mean, I think because now we have so much momentum, you know, in the pharma space, biopharma, you know, materials, egg, you know, you're starting to see these hundreds of companies, this hundred or plus customers, they get it. So it helps give confidence to other companies. If you're not a water freak, <laughs> water is not a cool sector. I mean, you don't go out there in the street and brag, look, I'm in water. Is so what? <laughs> when you're in biotech, it's a, it's a different story. You're now a cool kid. So does mm -hmm. that change something? Maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think my reason for making the switch is just that bigger impact. It's, uh, you know, I don't mean to be silly, but I feel like no, what we're doing sense. in yeah. biotech has such an incredible potential for impact. And not that innovation in the water space doesn't, but it does feel sort of incremental. It's a risk averse sector. I understand why it's really important to have our water be safe. So I understand that, but I think there are pockets and there are places where the water sector and the biotech sector can work together. And so I'm sort of bringing my two worlds together here in a way. In your pitch today, you mentioned trillions of dollars of potential markets. Mm -hmm. We sometimes speak in the water sector of we shall be investing one day one trillion if we want to bring the infrastructure at, oh, right. at scale. <laughs> And then everybody's looking and like, like that's ever going to happen. You put a slide where it was 35 trillion of, of, of a market. Four to 30 trillion. I know that's a very big range, but yeah, based on a McKinsey study, it's also the one Eric Schmidt from Google, you know, will quote as well. Pretty good source. Yeah, it's the potential. Of, it's like the, the, the full potential of the bioeconomy. Which means that you, you jumped from a very well-established water company with, with Dupont to a scale up and one would expect that that's a big difference but when you look at the valuation of the two companies they're pretty similar <laughs> you gave the number earlier today it's 1.6 billion which were raised that was with what the was IPO. raised in the ipo yes and the valuation i think at the highest was in the range of the 50 billion which is really comparable to the size of Dupont. Still, I guess from the inside, working for a 15-year-old company compared to the century established Dupont must be pretty different. Uh, yes. Is that the case? Culturally, yes, it is very different. And I can give some examples of those differences. So one is just, I think, the speed of taking external market data, whether that's customer feedback, whether that's investor feedback, employee feedback, and then just like making changes, even if they're not perfect, just that flywheel is so quick. It's like taking that information in, digesting it quickly, making a change, implementing the change. And I like that kind of metabolism, that agility. I also like agility with customers, flexibility. And I just feel like everyone's on the same page. You know, you don't have kind of this, my agenda is X and your agenda is Y. We all have the same agenda, <laughs> which is grow. Talking of growth, I guess you must have pretty aggressive in a positive way, ways to, to, to grow. If you raise 1.6 billion, I guess you have some money to burn. Do you have an objective to be profitable anytime soon? Or is it like really about growing the, yeah. the market I share? I mean, that's the balance, right? I mean, you, you need to make sure that you start become earnings positive before you need to go to the public markets or, you know, have a plan to, you know, get additional funding. So, I mean, I wouldn't say I can speak to the details of that. That's for the, the C-suite of the company. But certainly there has been a lot of growth and expansion, but there is certainly an eye towards, I think, a pretty aggressive 2025 goal. But I guess you're also building the IP, so it's not just That's about... Right today, but also how, what you're building for the future. If you're creating value, you right. still get the value down the right. line. Exactly. And if you think about the more programs we have, the more of that downstream value we get. That downstream value doesn't require us to open up the foundry space, right? So then you can start seeing how that 
can build. When we had this roundtables yesterday about how do we speed up the innovation, how do we get faster to commercialization, one of the things which was coming quite regularly as a pattern was we need to be more risk-taking, reward risk-taking, and really have that shift of mentality. Mm -hmm. Would you say looking at now your very personal case that you took a risk by embracing that, that new horizon with Ginkgo? Is it a risk? Sure. I mean, you're giving up something you know, a job you know, a sector you know, technology you know, people you know, a company you understand how it works to something completely different. Yes, it's a risk. You're mentoring people as well. Would you advise them to take the same kind of plunge than you took? I would. I mean, it depends on somebody's risk appetite, but I've never taken a risk that I've regretted or that hasn't expanded me as a human. Last year, not in our conversation, but when you were uh, on scene, you recommended two books, which I actually read on your recommendation. So I have to thank you for that. But that's, <laughs> I that hope was, they were good. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were good. Watch it always win and uh, flourish. I think flourish. flourish is the one you, you yeah, recommended on scene. Yeah, the uh, one of the co-authors. So that was your external eye and recommendation on the book. In between, you're in the process of writing a book yourself. Huh. Or are you done? It's done. Is it published? It will be published in the fall. By the time this interview airs, it won't be published yet. What's your final title? I've seen two, The Beautiful Mess. And... It's The Beautiful Mess. Okay. Why did you choose that one over Leave, Love, uh, and... Uh... Let It Go. I think because The Beautiful Mess just better depicted the topic. What's The Beautiful Mess? Uh, it's kind of the mess of life and this idea that we don't have to be perfect and we can embrace that. And it's sort of, you know, looking through the probably a lot of my eyes and my own stories about being a parent, particularly a mother and in a male dominated industry and like how to build your career and also sort of build a family and how that can be a big mess, but it can be really great and beautiful too. In water, we have this infamous 83 to 17 ratio between male and female, yeah. which means that there are more female priests and taxi drivers than water professionals. Do what you want with that comparison. Is it uh, anywhere different in biotech? I'm still new to this space. I know Ginkgo. And I'm trying to think of like, I am starting to go to more bio-based type events. But yeah, it feels much more diverse. I mean, Ginkgo as a company is young. It does have all different probably generations in it. Lots of people who have had lots of experience, whether it's in different industries or in the bio industry, to the founders, to a lot of like even the, the new engineers. So yeah, there's definitely a broad range, I'd say, in terms of the company itself. We're not as maybe globally represented as like a DuPont yet, but I feel like it's a little more balanced, but I I, I know it's better than the water industry. I Difficult don't, to be worse. I yes. don't, but yeah, it's hard to be worse. I don't know if it's all the way to a 50-50 yet. Why did you want to share that experience with a book? One of the because, podcasts. <laughs> yes, no, there's a, actually an answer to this. I just wanted other especially women who were like trying to do what I was doing just to not feel alone and uh, just to be able to just have a laugh at some of the insane, crazy stuff we do. Just be able to share that and not like, oh, I have to hide, to hide the fact that I have a toddler on my lap and I have the mute button and my camera off. And, you know, I think it's COVID helped us be better at that in general, but it's sort of just trying to like relax some of the stigma around that and then just provide hopefully some humorous stories that people can relate to and, and maybe some ideas. Um, it's not explicitly a self-help or advice book, but it kind of kind of fits in that genre, I suppose. You mentioned the laugh and the humorous aspect. I think yeah. that's something which really comes out of the copy of your website, um, <laughs> where you share kind of more personal blog posts. Mm -hmm. How important is the laughing aspect in your daily life? You know, yeah. there's this idea of if you are in the corporate world, you have to be serious, you have yeah. to be uh, almost sad. That's <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's what I'm trying to share is that there is so much like just humor and just craziness of life and just things just happen, you know, like things that are unexpected, especially when you're trying to do a whole bunch of things at once. <laughs> and I think sometimes it's nice to be able to sit back and just have a bit of a laugh instead of like a cry. You write and you talk about this sometimes dichotomy between raising a family, growing a career, enjoying the two, mm -hmm. assuming that you enjoy the two. I totally get why that is still also a gender issue. There's so many men and dads that are dealing with the same thing 100%. And in some cases, it's harder for dads because they don't get welcomed into the little networks that moms do automatically. So in some cases, it's, it's a huge challenge. So maybe my second book should be with dads. <laughs> I can give you my very humble, very limited example. I'm this week in Edinburgh, and I really appreciate being at the Bluetooth Forum and having the opportunity to meet with a lot of water professionals, but my third kid is one 
And when I left home, it was standing and on the verge of Ooh, walking, but wow. not walking. And yesterday my wife sent me a video and uh, he was walking and was uh -huh. like, I missed it. And yeah. I have three children. I missed it the three times. So oh. <laughs> makes me a triple person. <laughs> <laughs> no. but makes, you, makes you just unlucky and bad timing. <laughs> I reflected on it when my first CEO, when I started at Suez, retired. In his retirement speech, he said, what I'm hoping for my retirement is that I will discover my wife. And uh -huh. um, I thought if it had been reversed, if his wife had been retiring and she would have said that, Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been taken like a joke. It was taken like something like really... Something's really wrong. Yeah, something's really wrong. Right. So there's still this... We're in 2023. But I know. Still, uh, yeah. It's still there. Yeah. I mean, I was recently in a workshop with a number of senior women in, in water, in the water industry. And part of the reason for that workshop was to help figure out like succession planning and how do we help the next generation. And we even had like a cohort of young professionals and they did a panel after they had their kind of parallel sessions and shared with us. I think there was tears because it felt like they were having so much the same experience that the older generation did. And we really thought it wouldn't be as bad for them. <laughs> I mean, uh, hopefully it's not, but it was just like, oh boy, we thought we'd come a little farther, but maybe not. So I see I have to have a reality check on some of those. I can tell you, I'm looking forward to, to, to read your detailed opinion and, mm -hmm. and sharing about that in, in your book. So I'm looking forward to that. You have one more hat, which I'd like to cover. Uh, you are part of the Brave Blue Words Foundation board. Are you still mm -hmm. a member of the board? Um, yep. Brave Blue Word has this take to say, let's stop with the doom and gloom. Let's right. share the positive stories. Mm -hmm. So what is the most positive story which you can share with us today, which sends the message you, you, you'd like to, I mean, what's the first message you'd like to share with a cool story right now? Tricky uh, question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's something happening right now with someone who I mentor, who I've not only mentored, but sponsor. And those are two different things. So the mentor action is, let me help you prepare for this interview. The sponsor action is, let me introduce you to this hiring manager and you're perfect for this job and let me make you a recommendation. I was able to play a sponsor role in this case, which was actually really quite satisfying. And I think she is gonna get a new amazing job, which is gonna make her very happy. So that makes me happy. So there is your positive story. That's an awesome story. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. How do you put all of that into a week? You're writing a book. You're working in super mm -hmm. cool biotech. You're a board member. You're mentoring. You're a mom. Yeah. Uh, I probably have more downtime than anyone would ever believe. But I would say part of it is having such a great network, a great partner. My husband does all the cooking, does a lot of shopping. So it's like that. How do you sh truly share the household stuff? Mm -hmm. So that's been a huge, huge reason. Outsourcing where I can get someone to clean the house or babysitter here and there as needed. As you get older, you sort of figure out what's important and what to delegate. So there's that whole bucket of stuff, what to ignore. I had a, this is president, when I first joined Dow in 2012, and I was too new to know to be scared of this person, but he was coming in and there was a big board meeting and there was a big giant table and we're all sitting in a big square and everybody was all nervous because this was a new business president. What's he going to do? Is he going to fire people? Is he going to change the metrics? Whatever. And I'm just sitting there going, what is going on? And he walked in. <laughs> I don't know why he said this, but somebody got on about emails or volume of work or something like that. And he's like, you would be shocked at the stuff I ignore. And I'm like, I never forgot that. I'm like, he knows if he can say that, I can figure it out too. So what to ignore. Um, and then, yeah, I think too, just the reality of like, your kids getting a little older, like you young ones, kids getting older opens up a little more space. There's a lot of wisdom in, in that. <laughs> From all the various areas which you're touching, contributing, what's your metric for impact? What will tell you when you look in retrospect in, I don't know, five years, I had a positive impact? Sometimes you don't know. So it's interesting, even being here, it's like those echoes, you know, like a talking to some customers that I had at DuPont and I was trying new things and trying a new approach, new go-to-market approach. And then that customer from a, a very large CPG company coming to me and saying, we are installing this technology everywhere and we've qualified it. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. Cause that's what I was trying to make happen. Usually it takes a while to know what the impact is and it's usually backwards looking. So you just have to kind of do your best guess. I think looking forward, I would say if there's even, even like one synthetic biology program that I'm working on now, if I can lock that in, even just that one, it's a game changer just for the world. 
And part of me says, maybe I joined Ginkgo, like not that I would only want to do one thing. Obviously, I don't. I want to do a lot of things. But if I could just do that one thing, even like that would be success. So it's like kind of like, where do we where do we set our bar? Try and set it as low as possible. But this is necessarily a low bar. It's just something that I think has tremendous impact for the world in terms of the application and what it can do in terms of our carbon balance. Which is really pretty incredible because you don't have every day in your work something where you can say, hey, you can have an impact on the world. I would be happy if everything I do has an impact on my tone, you know? So <laughs> Can you yeah. give us a hint at what that is or is it fully embargoed top secret? It's a little bit top secret, but it has to do with a way to use CO2 as a as a feedstock. Say Very that. cool. But yeah, but in a way that could potentially be a different type of cost profile than current methods because it's hard to do that. It's hard to make carbon-carbon bonds from CO2. So, so not that we have to meet only at Blue Tech Forum, but maybe by next year's Blue Tech Forum, you might have more developments well, to that I, story. I, I hope before that, but why don't you uh, come to Ferment in Boston in next April? I look my calendar. <laughs> well, yeah. it's been a pleasure to have that that deep dive with you across you all these various topics. To round up these interviews, I have a set of rapid fire questions. Okay. Some of them, I guess you had last year, some are new. One okay. will go into your delegation font. It's time for the rapid fire questions. What is the most exciting project you've been working on and why? It's probably this example. It has to do with really creating a mechanism for negative carbon in a way that we haven't seen because some of the current methodologies like carbon sequestration, I think are pretty limited. So it's kind of like a, a very different way of looking at the problem. So that's exciting. Can you name one thing that you've learned the hard way? There's so many things. If you need oh. a joker card, there's a joker card always. No, no, no. When I fail or when I don't do well, it's when I don't have a good enough understanding of the stakeholders and their positions or the dynamics. It's important to understand the audience and know what's going on, on the other side, especially if you're trying to do something new. So sometimes I learn that the hard way over and over again, because sometimes it's just hard to get perfect information on that. But I think you have to remember to try. Is this something you're doing in your job today that you won't be doing it in 10 years? I would think I would have a probably different role within 10 years. I'd love to be the you know, chief sustainability officer of Ginkgo Bioworks someday. <laughs> so, but I want to cut my teeth on the current business development role, really understand how that works, how the company works. You want to be the cool kids among the cool kids. That's, that's really... <laughs> is that what that is? Uh, <laughs> That's what, how it sounds, at least. Okay, great. But <laughs> well, I'm sure you would I'll be. I'll take it. It would be awesome. Why is the trend to watch out for in the water sector? Now you have maybe a more of an external eye, so I'd be curious. I mean, a lot of them are showing up here, right? I mean, certainly decarbonization, climate adaption is a really big one. Too much water, too little water. So adaptation. We're not, no longer at mitigation, we're at adaptation. Yes. Okay, that's my delegation question. If I instantly became your assistant, you can ask me and delegate whatever you want. I don't guarantee I do it, but what would be the first thing you would delegate to me? I mean, I would say uh, help getting my book out into the world. <laughs> Just from a marketing standpoint would be... Well, that Good. is something I would be very interested in doing. I'm, I'm going to read it first, but um, from... Oh, help me get endorsements for it. Yeah, I still got to do that. That's definitely something I, I can pledge to. You gave me a good book recommendation, so I'm going to take for granted that your book is going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's out next month, roughly, when we're publishing that. You mm -hmm. should probably pre-order. You're going to open pre-orders, right? I don't know. I, I, I see. I need to work with a marketing group to figure out what I, I am working with the a marketing group, but I don't have all those details nailed down yet. If pre-orders are open, check the show notes. Check the show notes anyways. Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> of course. I'll put that on my LinkedIn if there's pre-orders available. And last question, we have someone to recommend me that should definitely invite on that podcast as soon as possible. The first person that came to my mind was Nicole Richards, who's the CEO of Alonia. That's very good I worked with her at DuPont. She's super cool. Great perspective. Great mind for, you know, business and technology and yeah, she's cool. Well, thanks a lot for the recommendation. Thanks a lot for everything you shared over that full discussion. If people want to follow up with you, where shall I redirect them the best? I think LinkedIn. I'm I'm pretty up to speed. Like, send me a message on LinkedIn. I do I do check those. So as always, check the show notes. You'll have the direct link to Kimberly's LinkedIn. And thanks a lot. Maybe talk to you next year. Maybe talk to you sooner. Maybe sooner. <laughs> That'd be great. Thank you. It's really you. fun. Thank you. It's fun. Thank 
Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.